Predators has got to be one of the best movies released in recent years. It was quite epic and well acted, and it also single-handedly saved Aliens, Predator, and Aliens vs. Predator. Because after Predators was released and found success, all three comics lines were relaunched. Like with Aliens Book 1, the first AVP comic gave rise to an entire long-running series that unfortunately ended in the year 2000 with the release of AVP Xenogenesis. Now, it wasn't a bad comic by any means. In fact, the artwork was really good, and the story, while not particularly particularly inspired was at least entertaining. Now, Xenogenesis referred to a cross-franchise event. Now, the event was supposed to give the franchise a new look and take it in a different creative direction. Apparently, it didn't work because after Xenogenesis, all three comics lines pretty much died. There would be very few AVP comics released prior to the success of Predators. They were mainly released to cash in on the AVP films. And the comics, of course, were always far superior. AVP Thrill of the Hunt was released in 2004 to cash in on the crappy, crappy AVP film. The comic itself has nothing to do with the film at all all, as it takes place during the 24th century, the same time period as Alien Resurrection. The comic does a decent job tying together the Alien and Aliens vs. Predator storylines. Which is something that AVP 3 World War does as well. Now, Alien, Predator, and Alien vs. Predator seem to pretty much take place in separate universes, mainly because they never reference one another in their respective continuities. But Three World War does reference a Predator comic that came out slightly before Three World War did. So now, let's take a closer look at Three World War by first taking a look at the covers. Since this comic is yet to have a trade paperback released, we're just going to take a look at the six covers for the six comics. The first one is kind of cheesy. We have a Predator controlling some leashed xenomorphs. I guess you can have an overkill hunting dog after all. The second cover has a very ugly looking Machiko Nagochi, the main character from the first AVP comic, fighting a Predator. If it wasn't for the very odd face and the massive hair, this cover would actually look pretty good. Now this is what I'm talking about. The artwork is just beautiful. The Predator looks awesome and Machiko actually looks human. However, this marine in the corner looks like a bloody zombie and really mars what would really be a excellent cover. Now this cover is my favorite of the lot. We have an extremely well-drawn Predator alongside an extremely well-drawn Colonial Marine fighting side by side against xenomorphs. Just epic. Cover 5 sucks. Machiko has a very pointy face. Enough said. Cover 6 is my second favorite. We have the skulls of a predator, colonial marine, and an alien all impaled on a combi stick. Really, this cover shows what is at stake in the war itself. The comic opens with some miners getting attacked by some predators. Now since highly trained special operations forces can get slaughtered easily, miners are armed with pulse rifles really don't stand a chance. Now these predators are different from the one seen in earlier predator comics. These are the Hish, a subspecies of predator that is without honor and enjoys killing for the sake of killing. And they are also completely hostile to the more common and honorable Yatja. And they're really inserted into this comic with some retroactive continuity that, while annoying, at least makes a bit of sense. We are then reintroduced to Machiko Nagochi, the protagonist from the first AVP Comic. She actually became a member of Dashinde's clan and hunted with them for about a year. In the events of AVP War, Machiko finally learned that the Predators hunted humans. The idea that it took her a year to turn against the Yatja is rather odd because she already knew for some time that they hunted humans. I think she mainly just snapped due to her complete and utter isolation. The Yatja didn't like her, and she could barely communicate with him due to the language barrier. And since she lacks mandibles, there are some sounds she physically can't make. So she had no one to talk to, and the Predators didn't really even acknowledge her accomplishments at all. And furthermore, when she actually had to fight her nemesis, known as Shorty, one of the Predators actually sabotaged her fight. To make a long story short, the Colonial Marines want Machiko to help them track down some Yatja so they can form an alliance to stop the Hish. 
they eventually meet up with a predator hunting clan, and Machiko gives them the universal greeting. Ba, weep, grana, weep, ninny bong. So after giving the universal greeting, Machiko and the Preds sit down to negotiate, only for them to get interrupted by an alien queen that broke loose. Yeah, the alien queen really knows how to use good timing to her advantage. This requires that the colonial marines and the predators work together to subdue it. And after they do so, the humans and predators form an alliance, and we then get treated to one of the most awesome images ever, a joint predator and human fleet. Sometimes, you just gotta take a step back and think about what you just saw. A joint human predator strike force arrayed against the Hish. You know, this might be the single most epic moment in all of the AVP comics continuity. What ensues is a series of extremely epic battles. Just look at this. We have Predator and human dropships heading towards this Hish-controlled planet. They're not even fighting, and it's already awesome. In the course of the first battle, the Yatja slash human fleet loses all communications due to a jammer. And they, of course, can't destroy the jammer from orbit because it disables advanced guiding systems. Now, the human ships themselves can contact each other through Morse code, but Machiko, the only interpreter there, doesn't know Morse code, so basically the two fleets are effectively cut off from one another. That's a pretty big single point failure, isn't it? But in any event, it does allow Ellis to actually look awesome, as he comes upon a plan to modify a missile so that it doesn't use an advanced guidance system. So he yo jos it down to the planet and fires off the missile, which destroys the jammer, but he gets shot down in the process, and Chico has to go save him, and she demonstrates once more how much a badass she is. The main goal of their attack was to acquire a glove that allows the Hish to control Xenomorphs. The only problem with this is the fact that this plotline really goes nowhere. Really, the whole Hish controlling Xenos plotline really is subsumed. It's not even really brought up again until they find the glove. And really, it's not even referenced until the last issue of the comic. Anyway, the main threat of the Hish it's just conventional weapons, which makes sense, because just because you can control Xenos does not make them automatically better than guns and ships and things of that nature. The biggest threat from the Hitch so far is their jamming device! Eventually, everything comes to a head and the humans and predators attack the Hish's home base. The Predator-Human Alliance has determined that the Hish controls Xenomorphs through the use of pheromones. So they come upon the plan to drop a queen alien right in the middle of their base so that she takes control of the Xenomorphs with her pheromones. They do so and then of course they only have to deal with a horde of ravenous Xenos, which they have to deal with for about five minutes it's because the Hitch decide to self-destruct their base. But for some odd reason, the Yatja want to stay despite knowing that they're going to self-destruct. The, the ending really isn't all that clear. In any event, Machiko gets cast out from Dosh and Day's clan because she doesn't want to stay despite knowing they're going to all die. And when you think about it, she chooses the more intelligent option. And Machiko gets her marking burned off. Look at that. That looks extremely painful. She's probably going to get brain damage from that. So with the Hiss destroyed, Machiko and Ellis return to their normal lives, and the galaxy can rest easier. Or can it? And so that is AVP 3 World War, a comic that not only lives up to the legacy of the AVP comics, but also sets a new standard of excellence. The artwork is just beautiful. Everything is drawn in a very realistic manner, and everything just looks like it should. The Colonial Marines don't just look like basic, generic Space Marines. They actually look like they did in Aliens. The Predators look okay, but they seem to be a bit more stylized than they should be. The fights are all quite epic, and you can actually follow what's going on. Overall, the art is just brilliant. 
brilliant and is very pleasing to the eye. And now, let's take a look at our two main characters, Michiko Nagochi and Ellis. In the first AVP comic, Michiko was pretty badass, and she had to be to fight alongside Doshinde. Here, she is kind of overpowered. I can understand having significant combat skills, but here, she's able to kill xenomorphs and predators with melee weapons. In AVP War, she had an epic battle killing just one predator with a melee weapon. Although it was her nemesis, so that might have had something to do with it. Also, in Three World War, she is way more cynical than she was in the past. You would have think that she would have lost everyone she ever cared about. But in AVP Prey, she was able to save just about everyone on the colony. And in AVP War, she was able to save pretty much everyone as well. Ellis is a decent character. He is neither completely helpless nor is he a complete idiot. He is, in fact, far less cynical than Machiko, despite the fact that he was betrayed by his commander in Aliens Berserker, and he actually had to climb inside the Mac suit that was present in that comic. And when he did, it almost killed him, because the suit itself was designed for someone to have cybernetic implants, which he didn't have, so basically the suit was cutting into his skin. And basically, the whole experience was very traumatic for him. But he still fought the good fight. And also, Talking about the Mac suit, that does bring up a pretty good point. Why didn't the Colonial Marines employ Mac suits? All they do in the battles is employ infantry for the most part. So why no Mac suits? Or tanks for that matter. I guess appropriate weapons aren't epic enough. This comic is indicative of one of the biggest issues with comics. It's just really hard to know what is coming up. I only discovered AVP 3 World War by reading the AVP wiki. Had I not done that, I would have never known this comic existed. Now, if you're a fan of AVP already, and you haven't heard of this, go out and acquire it immediately. It is that good. It stays true to the continuity, all the characters act pretty much like they should, and really, the artwork is really what sells this comic. It just looks so good. Now, if you're not really a fan of AVP and you haven't actually read any of the comics, I'd say start with the first comic. But even if you just decide to jump the gun and read this comic, you'll at least know what's going on because they do a decent job of recapping what has come before. So, with that, this is General Otz wishing you good Alien vs. Predator vs. The Terminator. And now for an even more unlikely combination, Alien vs. Predator vs. Witchblade vs. Darkness. Just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? And the comic is every bit as dumb as that name sounds. Or whatever makes you happy.